Well, top of the morning. It's great to be back uh, to share with you again. And we're going to continue on from where we were last week. My video got cut off and, and um, also I had a few questions sent to me. Some nice, or not too, not so nice, but that is okay. And um, sometimes what I'm saying can frustrate so many people because they believe in a lot of self-effort. You know, what they do determines the outcome of their salvation. But I've just come to the place of believing that it's where I trust and who I trust in that brings me into a place of rest and security and helps me in my day-to-day -day walk. Not that I can produce fruit of my own, but Jesus did say, apart from me, you can do nothing. And God has given us the Holy Spirit to bring about the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives and um, so I want to just continue on I don't want to get into too much but a couple of questions were asked a couple of scriptures were thrown back and I want to try address one or two of those scriptures to try give a fuller picture so last week we talked about people saying deny die to self die to self and I did say that nowhere in the Bible does it have the phrase die to self and that, that was a big eye-opener for me it kind of shook me when I found out that it wasn't in the Bible <laughs> when I was going around screaming from the pulpits for years. And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul did say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man is in Christ, meaning remember last week, we have a new address. Physically, we are where we are. I'm in my office, in my house, but spiritually, my new man, my new creature, we are it's seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And Paul basically says it in a phrase, in Christ, right throughout the whole of the New Testament, in the letters that he wrote. So, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Think of that. We're new, a new creature. Basically, that is the new man. We are spiritual beings. You know, I heard once, it once said that, I'm a spiritual being, possessing a soul, living in a body and that's the easiest way but we are spiritual beings first and foremost children of God who possess a soul which is a mind a will and emotions which helps us to engage in day-to-day -day life and we have a physical body that we have and we exist in while we're here on this earth and I basically said that if any man is in Christ he's a new creation the old has gone. So the question I asked was, what went? And most people, you know, they don't know what went. But basically what I came to the conclusion and understanding from scripture was that the body of sin went. The old nature, the sinful nature. Because so many years, the NIV, I think it's changed recently over the last few years. But for many years, the NIV changed the word flesh in certain parts of the scriptures. And most of us would have read the NIV and they put the word sinful nature. And because we're young and we're growing in the Lord, if we see a word in the Bible, we just take it. That's it. That's gospel. It says it there. And really that word was changed from flesh to sinful nature. And there is a difference between the flesh and the sinful nature, which we can discuss again at another, another time. But the sinful nature was exchanged for God's divine nature because we were given a new spirit as uh, Ezekiel 26 verse 26 explains the prophetic word came from Ezekiel and the fulfillment of that was given in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 where Paul says those who are joined to the Lord are joined to him one in spirit. We're given this new creature, this new born again spirit and the Holy Spirit comes in. And he joins himself and he communes with us. We commune with him. You know, sometimes we just got to put away the things of these, this world and allow our spirit and the Holy Spirit and to engage and communicate with the divine. Because we have a power, as I always keep saying, the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. And we are spiritual beings first and foremost. We went on then to talk about where Paul says in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Knowing this then, that our 
old self was crucified. So Paul tells us that the old self, when something is crucified, it's killed. And why was it killed? Because in Romans chapter 6 verse 3, Paul tells us that we were baptised into Christ's death. Meaning our sinful nature died the death. Uh, because of Christ we were baptized into Christ and as he was raised the Bible says we also now were raised to newness of life which was the new man and the Holy Ghost joining together and so we talked about that and also I also said in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 it says that since then we have been raised with Christ it says set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand side of God. Why? Because that is where we are seated. First and foremost. We. That's our starting point. Heavenly places. Not earth. Our starting point. Is in Christ. Seated with him. If we can see ourselves. It's not that we are full of pride. Or we are bigger than God. You know. But here's the issue. We must see ourselves in the light of who Jesus is. We have to. It's not a proudful thing as so many say. So lots of people want us to grovel on the ground. You know, who are you? You're just a, a worm compared to God. But that's not what God says. God actually calls me his child. God says that I'm his son. You wouldn't want your son or your child groveling and begging for their daily bread every day. <laughs> or if, if your child does something wrong, would you want them begging and pleading? Oh, please, oh, please forgive me. No. That is not the way our Father works. You know, He loves us. He has forgiven us. Paul says that, you know, forgive others just like we have been forgiven. He says that in Ephesians and in Colossians. It's a past tense. Anyway, so today we're going to talk a bit more about hurry up and die. So we do have the scriptures to show us that, you know, we have died, you know, we have been raised. The old is gone. The new has come. And so we must get into our minds the fact that the old body of sin died. But we're still left with the question, why do we still sin? And so we will get to that today. Um, we should get to it today if this phone doesn't go off and I can be quick enough. I want to read from Romans again. It's very important that Romans 6 is really understood by us all. And I'm going to read from verse 6 onwards. In Romans 6, chapter 6, from verse 6 onwards. Uh, Romans chapter 6, from verse 6 onwards, it says this. Knowing this. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified. I love this. It was crucified with him. With who? With Christ. God took our old nature, our old sinful nature, and he took it to Calvary. And he says this. It was crucified with him that our body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, we had no choice when it came to sin. We were slaves to sin because we had the nature of sin. If we have the nature of sin, we can't do nothing but sin. You can try all day long not to sin. Try all day long. But you're programmed to sin. That was your birth. You were born into sin. So it's natural to sin. And then he says this, um, that we should no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And he says this, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I love that. There's another version that says, Reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. He's not saying pretend you're dead to sin. You know, the word sin in the book of Romans is used 48 times. Eight of those times, it's a verb. But the other 40 of those times, it's a noun. 
You know, a noun is a person, place, or thing. A verb is basically an action word, like when we sin, a sinning. So basically, one is the fruit, sinning. The verb, the noun, is the root, which is the body of sin. And Paul says that the body of sin was done away with, and we were raised with him in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful, powerful uh, you know, basically we need the revelation of the Holy Spirit to pull back the curtains because I could say this to you all day long. And, you know, to be honest, I'm going to keep saying it every week because we need the revelation of the Holy Spirit because Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened that you may know. God wants us to be enlightened with truth, the revelation. It's not that this is new. This is not new truth. What it, what's important to understand is it's, it was new to me. Truth was always there. It's just for many, many years, so many people, especially from different denominations, they have a certain way of teaching. And there you go and try to dissolve what they believe. You know, and so some people, you know, I always say this. It's very hard to um, talk to a professor or a theologian, you know, because they're right. So they dedicated themselves all their lives to truth, you know, who are you to talk to me? And really I haven't very much, you know, you know, but I have learned to understand simple things, certain things that have brought freedom in my life. And I want to bring them to help so many who have been probably on the same journey, feeling bad and condemned and guilty and thrown themselves on the floor like I was for years and feeling nothing but horrible about yourself till eventually you give in and you can't take it anymore. And so the life that Jesus promises becomes no life at all. It becomes disastrous. And so many people have left church. The amount of people I've met over the last few years who used to go to church and didn't believe. And I always seem to have a conversation and they always come down with one, one root thing. It was the heavy handedness, the heavy handedness of the shepherd over the life and the guilt and the manipulation that they felt that led them to just walk away. There was no liberty. There was no freedom. In their walk with Jesus. And I just hope that something I share. You know will inspire and, and encourage you. To know that you are greatly loved. By the father. He loves you. He loves us all. He's always loved us from before the beginning of time. And he loves you now. No matter where you are. No matter what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. He loves you. He loves you. And it's his desire to bring you into a full place of fullness in life and see you succeed in every area of your life. That, that is, that's just the heart of God. And so today I want to continue talking about the whole dying to self. And when I made the video last week, I got one or two messages. And one of the messages I got was, you know, uh, didn't Jesus say, and I'm going to read the words from John chapter 12. Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honour him. And so the question basically was, Jesus did say, unless a grain of wheat die, that we must die. But most people have to understand when you look at the gospel and it says at the beginning of Matthew, the New Testament, you know, the New Testament doesn't begin with Jesus in a manger. Because if you look in Hebrews chapter 9, I think it is, or 10, it says that a will or a covenant does not come into effect until the person that wrote it dies. And basically what that means simply is if you try to go and take your mother and father's inheritance the solicitor would stop that straight away and nip her in the bud because you'd have to wait for them to die before you receive their inheritance. We had to wait till Jesus died and the Holy Spirit came then after he was raised from the dead and that's where the new covenant begins. So when you see Jesus coming into Israel, he never spoke to a Christian in his life. Now we get an awful lot of truth and we can feed and uh, we, are, we can glean so much from the life of Jesus, the words of Jesus. But you have to understand that his mission was to the Jews. But this was basically a salvation scripture. He was basically preparing people to understand that unless a grain of wheat dies in the ground, that you, th there is a dying, there is a coming and dying to the old life 
But then there's the whole picking up of the new life which is in Christ Jesus. And you don't do that every minute of every day or even every day or every week, once a week, every time you get to church on Sunday, I'm going to die this morning, throw myself down on the altar. Anyway, you know, it was the Jews that went to altars, not Christians. But, you know, we don't throw ourselves down every week crying and weeping at altars. We actually have to understand that Christ has forgiven us. He has forgiven us. The Bible says that he shed his blood once and for all, meaning one death for all sin. Is it good to say sorry to God? Of course it is. We say sorry and apologize to one another, and especially to God, out of relationship. But our words doesn't bring forgiveness. Our words doesn't do that. It's the blood that brought forgiveness. We are a forgiven people. Not we are being forgiven, but we are a forgiven people. So Jesus, when he uses these words to Jewish people, he's not talking to Christians. He's talking to people who are under the law. And he can still talk to us through that as well. But he's basically bringing a salvation message, meaning that in order to have life, you must die. And so basically when we come to Christ and we receive of his life, our old life is killed and our new life is raised up and we are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's powerful, powerful understanding. You know, some of the people would say to me, but Jesus did say, deny yourself and take up your cross. I think he said that a lot down here. He said that in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. Jesus did say, you know, you know, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And basically what that means, when we read in Romans 6, when he says, reckon yourself to be dead to sin. You know, basically what that is, is we have to recognize every day that we died. We take up our cross in a sense by recognizing that we died. And every time we are tempted to sin, every time the enemy comes to entice us with, with, with things or whatever it is to go and sin, you know, we reckon ourselves to be dead. This is not who we are. So it's not the conviction of God coming and saying, you, you rotten sinner. No, it's the conviction in a sense where the Holy Spirit comes to convict us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Stephen, you don't do that because you're a son of God. It's not you don't do that because you're a dirty, rotten sinner. I tell you what, the more you believe that you're a dirty, rotten sinner, you will do that. The more you believe that you've got to do A, B and C in order to be free from temptation or from evil or whatever it is, you'll give in to that. Law produces sin. Scripture is clear. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56, even Romans 7, even some, one or two verses in Romans 6, it's clear. It's the law that brings about sin in people's life. When you tell a child, now I'm leaving the room, but don't put your hand in the, key, the cookie jar. We give them a law. Don't do it. Don't put your hand in the cookie jar. You walk out the door. What's that child doing? He's putting his hand in the cookie jar. Maybe if you hadn't even said anything, he probably wouldn't have done it. He probably wouldn't have even paid attention to it. Well, he might have. If it was me, I would have eaten the cookie. I love cookies. I love chocolate biscuits. But anyway, you know, Jesus did say, deny yourself. But again, it's a salvation message. The other thing people text me, and someone wasn't very nice to me, but I, again, I accept that, and it's okay. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily. And this is where this whole die to self is taken from, this one scripture, I die daily. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is actually talking about himself putting his life on the line for the gospel where he self talks about a fought wild beast in Ephesus and basically this man was stoned, whipped, beaten. Paul got everything and basically he's saying, I die daily, I put my life on the line for the gospel. But he's not talking about dying to self and killing himself every day so that Jesus would live. You know, if you go back to that verse in John chapter 12, now listen to what he says here. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and it dies, it remains itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So the only way for us to bear fruit is to die. So basically the fruit of God comes when we die to the old nature. But listen to what he says. He who loves his life loses it, and he who lay hates his life in this world shall keep it. You know, basically some people actually think that scripture is even for believers today. We must hate our lives. You know, when I lived like that, I hated, 
even my life as a Christian, oh, I can't go to cinema, oh, and when I did, I felt bad, and no, I can't go and watch something where someone gets shot or whatever, maybe we shouldn't, but the issue was I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't do anything, that was, and so every time I did do it, it was just guilt and condemnation, and it was just being heaped and heaped and heaped until eventually I was buried in this ball of muck of my own condemnation, and it wasn't the way God intended. God didn't tell me to hate my life. This is not about Christians here hating their life now. This was about someone who comes to the conclusion, who is not a Christian, that that world is empty. It's empty and it has nothing, nothing to give to you. And you come to Christ. You know, there's a great story about a man called Jairus. I'm going to share this. And Jairus was one of the guys who looked after the temple utensils. And there's a story about Jairus in Mark chapter 5 and his daughter is dying. And the way I see Jairus, Jairus is one of those people who probably had a good few bob in his pocket, a nice home, well respected by the local elders and leaders and by the people because he worked in the temple. You know, you would see Jairus, you would bow down in front of him or whatever, you know. So he had a lot of prestige in the community, you know. And But something happens to Jairus one day where his daughter is dying and it's a tragedy and so Jairus is left wondering what he should do but you know Jesus the most hated man in Israel at the time was going around healing people he was going around setting people free opening blind eyes restoring their fears cleansing the leper raising the dead preaching the good news of the kingdom and Jairus hears about this Jesus but Jairus has a, a decision to make. He says, do I go to this Jesus? Because if I go to this Jesus, it means I'll probably lose my fancy home. I'll probably lose my few bob. I'll probably lose my position in the temple. I'll probably lose everything. But the thing about Jairus was, his daughter's life meant more than all of that. And he runs to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, come and heal my daughter. You know, Jesus went straight away didn't say a word just went and healed that daughter and I realized why see Jesus knew what it took for Jairus to come to him he knew that he weighed up everything in his coming to him and he was saying Jesus I'm willing to deny all of that for you to come and bring life into my life that's what I'm willing to do I don't care what all of that means some people a lot of us come to the place and we realize that this world is empty chasing money chasing jobs chasing careers chasing it all it can all be taken in a moment by one bit of bad news but what will never be taken what cannot be taken and what cannot be shook is what we have the unshakable kingdom of god living within us we have the kingdom of heaven the power to heal the power to set free this ministry of the holy ghost in each and every one of our lives we have it's unshakable it cannot be shook. It cannot be shook, but everything else can. And it's important through these days that we learn to understand this is not about denying myself you know, every day and you know, throw myself to the ground. This is about me standing in the authority that Jesus came. He came back after he rose from the dead and ascended. He came back to his disciples and he said, Now such as I have, I give to you. And the Holy Ghost came and set these people on fire. You know, with a passion and a purpose and a, a perseverance, you know, to go forward into the world and preach the gospel and to share this kingdom with every man, woman and child. They weren't killing themselves every day. They came and they gave up that life in one moment and they became new creatures in Christ. And the Holy Ghost was communing with them and they were communing with the Holy Ghost on a daily basis and they turned the world upside down and we have that same power inside of us god we can turn the world we can turn the world upside down we can we can reflect the image and the likeness of jesus you know one part one part of the world might hate us but there's a part out there who are hungry and in need to hear the good news of the father's love for mankind and they are ready to hear that message especially now in the age that we're living in people's lives have been shook you know, you know, we have so many people losing jobs, so many people losing homes. They can't pay cars, they can't pay phones, they can't pay bills, they can't pay for food. You know, 
all of these struggles are happening right now and it's a time where we can be the arms and the legs of Jesus to this world right now. We can encourage, minister, strengthen as many people as we can. Bringing Christ to people is one of the greatest things that we could ever do. Not screaming, hurry up and die every day to people. That is not the way to bring people into fullness of life. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it in all of its fullness. Hating your life is not fullness. Loving the new you, accepting the new you, and sharing the new you. That's what God wants. He wants us to live in the abundance of life. He wants us to know that even when we fail, even when we mess up, that we can run to him. We can run to him. And he doesn't hold any record of wrong. Scripture is clear about that. You know, in, in Hebrews, it talks about, you know, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Why? Because they died in Christ. And now you have been raised in Christ. You know, the gospel is a wonderful gospel. You know, I see so many preachers um, online now at the moment. And some of them are getting very angry. And, I, you know, they're, they're screaming out, we need to tell people the truth. You can't be giving a wishy-washy message on the love of God. Well, it's the love and kindness of God that leads to repentance. You know, people would say the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The problem when people read that is they don't realize that grace and truth is synonymous. It's one word. They're both together. Grace is the truth and the truth of the gospel is the grace of God because Jesus is the unmerited favor of God. He is God's gift to mankind. The gift we didn't deserve. It's, it's basically this gospel is the nearly too good to be true news. It really is. And it's a message that can be received but how we bring forth this message is very important. You know, it was people who loved me that enabled me to respond properly to the gospel. Don't be a minister of hate. Come and deny yourself. Turn up born. That is not the way of the heart of the Father. God wants us to bring the heart of who he is. Do you remember I told you before, before the creation of this world, it says in the beginning of the world, in the beginning was the word in John's gospel chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That word with means to be torn towards someone face to face. You see the father was face to face with the son. The son was face to face with the father. The father was face to face with the Holy Spirit. The Son with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit with the Father. And there was just, just, just this constant, you know, loving on each other, selflessly giving of each other. And then in this communion, in this Godhead, you know, they decided, you know, let us make man in their image. And then God, God, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit brings forth mankind. You know, I did say as well in Ephesians chapter 2, let me end here, but I just failed to say it again. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. We are God's workmanship. The word is, the Greek word poemi. It's, a, you know, the word where we get poem from. And when he, says, when he says that we are God's workmanship, we are God's poem, it means God has taken the innermost expression of his heart and he created us. That's how much we are loved. God, we are the innermost expression of the love of God. And God really loves us and he longs and desires communion with us. And I just pray and I, I ask the Lord today that something of this love, the love of God, will capture your heart because it will be the love of God that will cause you to turn away from the emptiness of life. It's the love of God that will cause you to turn away and look to Him and receive of Him and understand, understand that apart from Him, we can do nothing. Remember in Galatians, Chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But the life I now live, this new life. So we have a life that's been crucified and we have a life now 
that we're living in Christ. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not I don't live by my faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Like Jesus has given us faith. And it's this faith. The word, how, what does Romans 10, 17 say? Um, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Actually, it says Christos, meaning Christ. Faith cometh by the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of Christ. And when we begin to read the word of God and read about our identity and how much God loves us, there is a witness, this faith. We begin to receive of the goodness, receive of the grace and mercy of God and begin to see it manifest in our day-to-day -day life. God loves you. He loves you. I want to uh, say that to you today. God loves me. He's mad about me. In fact, when you, open, when you go to God's fridge, when you get to heaven, you're going to see my picture on the front of that fridge. And all the angels, he points to that picture and he says to the angels, you see him? That's my boy. And you'll be thinking, yeah. No, he's up there and he's taking out his wallet, showing all the angels saying, that's my boy, Steve-o, Steve-o boy. But he loves you. And uh, I want to leave you there. You don't have to die to self. You can begin to love yourself. Why? Because you know that, that you are loved by God. And the love of God. Nothing will ever separate you. Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. And where are you positioned? In Christ Jesus. That's our new address. So God bless you. And have a great week this week. And I'll speak again. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.